Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the virtual lecture by Dr. Ricardo Pellegrin Tawada entitled Pursuing Better Status and More Freedom, Social Mobility and the Legal Profession in 19th Century Cuba. My name is Jorge Duani, I'm the director of the Cuban Research Institute at Florida International University of Miami, which organized today's event. I'm also happy to acknowledge the co-sponsorship of the FIU Libraries and the Kimberly Green Latin American and Caribbean Center here at FIU. I'm pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Ricardo Pellegrin Tawada, who is currently a visiting professor uh, of Latin American history and North American studies at Western Oregon University. He's also the coordinator of the Latin American studies program there. Uh, he earned his PhD in Latin American history at Florida International University, and also holds a master's uh, degree in law from the University of Miami, as well as a BA in law from the University of Havana. Before joining Western Oregon University, he taught history and law at FIU and at the University of Havana. His main research interests are legal history, law and society, colonial policy, and constitutionalism in Cuba. He's received numerous fellowships and research grants, including several from FIU, the Max Planck Institute at, in Germany, the James Madison Foundation, and the Tinker Foundation. He's also a recipient of a 2020 Villasayala Library Travel Grant at FIU. Dr. Peregrin Tawada has conducted archival research in Spain, Cuba, and Mexico, and has lectured widely in professional conferences held throughout the United States, Canada, Spain, Germany, Mexico, and Peru. He has published several essays on law, race, and religion in Cuba, as well as legal history in Rome. We're very proud of his professional accomplishments as an FIU graduate. Before turning to the speaker, I want to remind you uh, to, that you can submit uh, questions uh, during and after the presentation to our speaker by clicking the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen. 
And then at the end of the lecture, I will raise as many questions as I can to Dr. Pellegrin Tawada. Our entire event uh, hopefully will be over by about 3, 3.15 p.m. So without further ado, I give you Ricardo Pellegrin Tawada. Hi, good afternoon all. Uh, thank you for being here. I would like to begin my presentation by acknowledging uh, those who have been uh, made possible my presentation here today. First of all, to the Cuban Research Institute and some of its members like Dr. Jorge Duani, Aime, and Sebastian, who has been very supportive this week. Also to the Kimberly Green Latin American uh, Center at Flor International and to the librarians who work with me this week, which are uh, from the Special Collections, Anya uh, Gonzalez, and from the Library of the College of Law, Marisol and Maria. I also would like to acknowledge my friends and colleagues who have been here with me supporting this week, uh, Doctors Maite Morales, Gloria Lopera, and Judith Mancilla, who has been also made this week uh, way more enjoyable. So well, uh, thank you for, for allowing me to present here today. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen and then beginning with the presentation. So the title is Pursuing Better Status and More Freedom, Social Mobility and the Legal Professions in 19th Century Cuba. This title comes as part of my, uh, I'm, my dissertation now becoming um, uh, a manuscript. And as I've been developing this research, I've been looking more uh, to the social transformations that has been aligned to, to the legal professions in Cuba since the colonial times up to the 19th century. So first of all, it's important to identify those legal professions, mostly focusing on lawyers, procuradores, and notaries, while we also can include relators of the court and judges. So there is a clear distinction between lawyers and procuradores, so this work is mostly focusing on lawyers, which sometimes we mention, or we tend to incorporate all of, these all of these professions within this only word. But lawyers are going to be those who are being um, received a special authorization to argue in front of the court. And therefore they are going to, they have to be uh, educated in an accredited university uh, and also have spent at least a couple of years of an internship in a law firm or in this case, law office, that will allow them to uh, continue this practice by their own. In the case of Cuba, however, this group became uh, prohibited very early in the, in the history of Cuba. So since 1513, there are supposedly a complaint of the neighbors of Cuba, which I, that's what I brought this map with the date of the establishment of the very early first villages. And as we can see, the only first two villages were Barcoa and Bayamo, and they were established between 1512 and 1513. So if neighbors complained this early, that meant that there were already a few lawyers um, working on the island uh, just after the beginning of the first settlements. However, apparently there was not necessarily only a complaint of the of the neighbors. It seems that also these lawyers were in contradiction with the conquistadores. They were in contradiction with the uh, members of the court since the Audience of Santo Domingo had been established in 1508. And also with the procuradores who are working at the same time on the island and they didn't have the same rank, but they were also public officials, meaning that they were going to be the representation of the crown on the island and therefore they're going to have um, a direct communication with the monarchy. So based on a recommendation of the procuradores, lawyers are going to be there for forbade from the island thereafter. And this is going to create a very special situation because now being a lawyer in Cuba meant that you were a very special person since there were going to be very, to be very few and none of them working privately. So the first lawyers are going to arrive in Cuba after 1556 when some of those are, uh, members of the court are going to start taking over positions on the island in the new position that has been created by the crown, which is the lieutenant governor, whose translation was um, teniente gobernador letrado. El teniente gobernador letrado was the person authorized to provide legal advice to the court, I mean, to the cities. And we're going to find that some of these uh, um, lieutenants are going to establish in the main or major towns such as Havana, Bayamo, Santiago, or Puerto Principe. 
problem is that since there were so few, there were only one in each of these towns, and they already were part of the establishment, so they were part of the government. We are not going to see in these lawyers a lot of private practice. However, they were still scarce. And then based on this necessity, we're going to find the very form of social mobility. All of these lawyers were supposed to be part of the either nobility or close to the crown or have a, high, a higher social rank. However, since there were constant complaints about the, how few lawyers there were in Cuba, in the 17th century, the Bishop of Cuba that is going to be relocated to Mexico is going to create in Mexico a scholarship. So at least six individuals from the island were going to be brought to Mexico uh, to Mexico to work in a college and therefore become bachelors. With these bachelors, they were going to be able to be lawyers in Havana and therefore receive um, uh, a public position. There were there were many cases of many of some of these. Uh, uh, Cubans who were now going to study in, um, in Mexico, and they're going to come back to Cuba and easily take one of the positions that were available since there were so few, and therefore become uh, members of the establishment and uh, develop a social and um, uh, political career with economic benefits. So this is going to start changing in the, seven, in the 18th century, when we're going to see that the number of lawyers is going to go increasingly over the century. Most of this is because of the foundation of the University of Havana. So there is a royal order from 1727 that established that only five lawyers were enough to provide the services that Havana required. At this moment, the population of Havana was about 70,000 people. So there was a still really not, I mean, it was probably necessary to have more lawyers or more people providing legal services. Um, the foundation of the University of Havana then is going to provide space for more people to study law and therefore becoming lawyers or at least authorized to provide legal services. However, they are not going to graduate so many people as we're gonna see in a moment. And the numbers are going to start increasing, but not too much. The major jump in the amount of lawyers that is going to happen during the 18th century is going to be after the English occupation of Havana. And it's because of the boost that this provides to the economic uh, of the economy of the island, especially related to the transformation of the sugar industry and the reinforcements of the military that Charles III is going to, brought, to bring to Cuba after they recuperate the island. So these two spaces are going to increase trade on the island and then more people is going to start coming, especially from Europe. So these migrations are going to increase the population of the island and then therefore more providers of legal services are going to be required. However, Although many Creoles have been attending the School of Law at the University of Havana, they are going to face some restrictions. For example, the royal orders of 1784 and 1789 are going to favor peninsulares in taking over positions that usually would have been expected to also be occupied by um, people from Cuba. These are going to block the expectations of some Creoles. However, they are still going to start attending the law school in order to try to get one of those positions in the establishment that is going to allow them to incorporate to the public sphere and therefore uh, be part of this social mobility that few uh, people from Ireland, uh, from the island are trying to, to do. There is a moment in the very late 18th century, which is the establishment of the Audiencia of Puerto Principe in 1800, when many I mean, there was the expectation that the establishment of the first audiencia on Cuban soil was going to increase the opportunities for those who were living in the island with a law degree to become part of now this new audiencia. The problem is that, as I've been checking the, in, in, the, in the name of the members of this court, pretty much the same people that used to work in the Audiencia of Puerto Principe was now, I'm sorry, in Santo Domingo, now it's going to be relocated to the Audiencia of Puerto Principe without a real impact. However, the fact that now there is a, a court on Cuban soil is going to necessarily require more legal experts to provide legal services. So how does these um, uh, lawyers that are living in Cuba at the end, or at the turn of the 19th century, which is, in the case of Havana, a group of more or less 100 lawyers look like. Well, this group is going to be mostly peninsulares or some wealthy Creoles, that, which is the case of Francisco Arango Parreño, the one in this picture. Most of them are going to engage on public and official activities, but 
they are going to lack professional organizations. This lack of organizations, along with the lack of legal uh, services available, are going to provide a space for the increase of pettifoggers or plecaplectos, which were those who were providing legal advice without the requirements. And the population then is going to mostly continue relying in this in a small number of procuradores. And I say this small because usually there is this idea that were many procuradores. Actually, in this moment, at the turn of the 19th century, there is nine procuradores in Havana, which means that actually this number was also pretty small considering the size of the growing population. So what is going to happen then is that although this group is going to be pretty exclusive and selective, some people is, is going to be able to join this group based on meeting the same uh, criteria of being part of the elites or being part of the peninsular uh, groups. One case is, um, which is a representation of Jose Maria Heredia and is those who are part of the peninsular groups. So, there are many Peninsulares officials who hold uh, law degrees, not only in Cuba or the Caribbean, but in the entire Spanish America. And after the wars of independence, many of these lawyers, or at least public officials with a law degree and potential lawyers, are therefore going to start establishing in Cuba. Many of them are going to apply to try to keep their privilege and, and rank and position, but it's impossible because they are, all go they are just going to try to join an already field uh, public uh, sector and the reforms that the Bourbons are going uh, were going to Cuba during the late 18th century didn't really increase the the size of the uh, of the bureaucracy to incorporate so many lawyers over a few span of time. So many of these lawyers are going to to go to Cuba trying to boost their career or as the father of Jose Maria Heredia is going to move forward to another positions. But for in this process, Jose Maria Heredia, for example, is going to be born in Cuba and eventually he's going to return to Cuba and become a lawyer on the island. The other example is as part of this same movement, the family uh, Del Monte. They used to live in Dominican, what is now the Dominican Republic, Santo Domingo. And after the Haitian invasion of this territory, they are going to uh, relocate to Cuba. And along with them, I have identified a significant list, like almost every lawyer or legal advisor of any, uh, any sort that used to live in Santo Domingo is eventually going to relocate to Cuba and try to establish in there, also trying to compete with this already collapsed uh, bureaucracy. So, the reaction of the Cuban lawyers to this potential incorporations to this exclusive group are going to be uh, for the call to create a Colegio de Abogados or which is Bar Association in Cuba in 1812. The important factor in this is that these Cuban lawyers are going to request to create their Colegio based on the statutes of the Colegio de Abogados in Mexico City, which had just has been reformed in 1808. These requires, uh, requirements were pretty strict. As we can see, for example, they required to be enlisted in the audiencia, which is the normal thing to happen, but they also require from these lawyers good life and customs, lineage and limpieza de sangre, the production of 12 witnesses, along with seven certificates of baptism, and also the scrutiny of the potential wife and their families. So they were, of course, trying to keep the group small and exclusive and preventing the cooperation of so many people to the legal profession. The government at the same time is going to side with the local lawyers in this intention to keep the social, to prevent social mobility within the legal profession and are going to create a quarter system across the island, establishing the exact amount of lawyers that they were expecting to have in each of the major towns across the island. As we can see, it was based on sometimes in population, but sometimes also uh, just in on recommendations. Uh, for example, in the city of Ogin, just to give you an example, there were three lawyers authorized to work on the on the city, whereas the population was estimated to be along like twelve thousand inhabitants, which of course was not going to be sufficient to provide the legal services to the whole population. The problem is that despite, despite the efforts of the lawyers from Havana to create a colegio to prevent the cooperation of all the lawyers, or despite the quarter system established by the government trying to prevent more lawyers to establish and work in these cities, 
the students of the University of Havana has been growing as the population of the city of the island has been growing and there are more and more graduates every year. Actually, we see a trend that is going to favor the studies of civil law and decreasing studies of canon law. So as we can see, since the foundation of the University of Havana in 1728, during the 18th century, the university graduated a few lawyers or a few, well, not lawyers, but they, they uh, gave law degrees um, to a few amount of people like every decade. However, these numbers are going to increase rapidly after the 1800s, and then they are going to uh, graduate almost like 100 new potential lawyers every year or every decade. So this transformation then is going to create a necessity because most of these lawyers or potential lawyers that are graduating are going to start applying for positions, mostly in the bureaucracy, mostly trying to join the administration, which has been already collapsed. This is not exclusive of the whole island, but we see particularly in Havana, how this increase in the number of graduates is also going to represent an increase proportionally in the number of lawyers working on the city. And at the same time, there is also coincidence with the growing of the population and we can see in the first part of this chart between 1800s and 1850. So what is going to be the solution, okay, the, the question is first, and what, where, how, we do, how do we see here the social mobility? The, it is evident that if there is so many new students of law and so many new lawyers working across the island or in the city, that new families that were not those exclusive initial families that used to control the legal practice are now incorporated to the legal profession in a way or the other, but for sure holding a law degree. So the question then is where all is all these people coming? And the answer that I found in the sources is that most of these people are coming from the immigration of Europeans that was taking place after the recuperation of the um, of, of, this, of, of Havana after the English occupation. So many of these families are moving to Cuba, sometimes as a poor immigrants, are going to start building up their life now in Cuba in a more favorable context. One of the most successful examples of this social mobility, we have it in the Chaplet family. The Chaplet family arrived to Cuba during the mid 18th century as poor immigrants from Poland. So they are going to experience a process of assimilation. They are going to transform their last name. They are going to drop the original the last name was Chaplet, so they are going to drop one of the P's and going to just be called Chaplet thereafter. And even when the original couple that immigrated to Cuba was not um, economically successful, the, their, their son is going to join the military and eventually is going to start developing a career that is going to allow him to start buying lands across Havana. As he was buying these lands, he became a landowner and then he started joining other circles within the Havana society because he was identified as one of those persons that were owning those lands and developing. So he's, through these means, he's going to be able to marry his son with a low novel of Cuba. And this connection with the nobility is going to allow him first to post his son to be a member of the local bureaucracy, which is this Jose Gaspar Chaplet Davila that we see here, who was a low administrative official in the local administration. But the next generation, which happens to be during the early 19th century, is going to be a different group of lawyers that as we can see out of all the children they have, all of them studied law. And this is how the, we see this jump in the numbers because a significant number of all these new generation of students are going to start attending the law school in order to gain a law degree and eventually, hopefully get a position in an already pretty much tight uh, local bureaucracy. This, is, this becomes actually uh, a trend because as we can see here, all the blues names are going to be lawyers, meaning that it's not only the first generation, but also the your children and the adult grandchildren that now are going to start studying law and inheriting somehow the, uh, the profession. At the same time, they are going to start building up connections with other families. And we can see here 
um, the connections through these red names with other families that are also members of the legal exclusive community. And uh, in order to prevent the incorporation of other lawyers, whereas they already has just joined based on these economic developments and marriages. There is also a gender issue here, which is very interesting because as we see, of course, in this moment, women were not allowed to attend universities. So they, uh, the, the daughters of this family were not going to be lawyers themselves. However, they are going to marry lawyers from other families in order to build bridges across um, the social networks of Havana. So in or, once, of this, once these families has achieved these positions, they are going to develop some mechanisms that we can cover later in the Q&A to confirm or boost their social influence. We see, for example, that they not only study law and try to procure a public position, we see that a lot of them sought judicial recognition of novel, of novel titles. They married Creole novels. They uh, occupy honorary positions in the judiciary and even non-permanent faculty positions at the University of Havana. The University of Havana usually was very understaffed. And we can see how many of these now wealthy members of the aristocracy are going to uh, try to become teachers. Although even when they were not actually teaching, they hope their names to be listed uh, in, the, in the official publications. And there was a case once when some of those names were not incorporated in the annual publications of the names and they sued the university because they felt an offense on the missing of their names in just pursuing the record, the social recognition that the publications of these names will imply. Uh, the other two last forms uh, I found are public charity after disasters and pandemics and also religious donations. So, however, while all these groups of now successful lawyers are going to try at the same time to keep the exclusivity of the group that they just has joined, we see that the liberal Spain is doing reformations that are going to actually facilitate the incorporation of new lawyers, or at least more people to attend law school and eventually become lawyers themselves. And these are the scholarships of insolvency that are going to start being provided in 1838 and 1848 and are going to facilitate that people that were identified as low income also attend the schools of law and become eventually lawyers. All of this is in contradiction with the actual official policy because as we see across the 1840s, the uh, Spanish government is going to start authorizing colegios de abogados, which are bar associations, in order to prevent the increase of the numbers while the number of graduates are just increasing. This is why we see a big discrepancy during the 1840s because there were many lawyers now that were trying to get a position, whereas they were forbade because they either didn't meet the criteria or they didn't find an available spot in the administration. So in order to contradictorily uh, prevent people from joining the profession, then the audiencia is going to start authorizing less and less lawyers every year during the 1840s, as we can see here in this chart, reaching its lower point in 1851. And this situation is going to leave a lot of lawyers in, in a very precarious and uh, economic situation. And this is why we see that the Society of Lawyers Mutual Aid that was authorized by the Spanish Crown across the empire in 1847 is going to be created in Cuba in 1848, just four uh, months after uh, the institution was allowed by the Crown. However, this, this institution is not going to be very successful in Cuba because it required the economic contribution of the lawyers in order to uh, uh, create a fund that will help lawyers or their families in times of crisis. So this association was supposed to help those lawyers that were not being able to successfully, like the chaplains, became landowners or have a good position in society, but all these large numbers of lawyers that were just graduating and didn't even have a job or a position in the administration. Well, it had it, it gathered up to like 45 members, but they didn't really contribute to the fund. I interpret that probably because they didn't really have any funds to contribute to. And at the end, they just dissolved themselves in a final meeting in 1852, only four years after it was created. Uh, however, 
we see that lawyers in Cuba, although didn't join the fund or didn't join the mutual aid fund, they just wanted to work. And we can see this difference when the government authorized finally the establishment of the Bar Association of Havana in 1852. At this moment, the city was estimated to have around 450 lawyers. And as we can see here in this chart, most of them, which would be those uh, um, in purple, they joined the organization, but they didn't participate in any of the events of the association, not even in the, the, in the selection of the dean. So they didn't really care too much about joining the organization, but for the single fact that they needed to be members of it in order to practice as a lawyer. Or we even have a small group that they didn't even join the organization, probably because they had a position in the administration and they didn't require this authorization to work. But the difference is, is, is contrasting, and we can see then how this growing number of lawyers are trying to uh, find their ways through the profession in a pretty difficult and tight. Up to this moment, the number of available seats in the bureaucracy hasn't really changed. And this is then the moment when most of these lawyers are going to realize that they need to start increasingly providing legal services privately. This is something that has been happening since uh, the beginning of the century. Uh, actually, there is a report of a lawyer from Mexico who visited Havana in 1917. And when he was walking through Havana, he was surprised because of the amount of law offices that he saw uh, with the signs of offering legal services. So this situation in the 1850s has just been worse. And while there is a small group of successful lawyers, the others are still struggling in order to uh, offer their private services uh, in a very competitive environment. Uh, it, probably one of the last moments of we see this um, um, uh, social mobility is during the wars of independence. The wars of independence are going to reduce the population of lawyers across Cuba almost by a third. And as we can see here in the chart, the major, all of the major cities lost a lot of uh, lawyers. So the city of Havana, the University of Havana is going to start authorizing more people to study law based on this necessity. And they are actually going to increase the number of scholarship of insolvency in 1872 up to four more um, uh, 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 candidates. Uh, and we can see how based on this motivation, apparently, while the number of lawyers reduced because they were participating mostly in the wars of independence, the number of students on the other hand increased. Some lawyers benefited from this, which is, for example, the case of Evelio Rodriguez Lendian, who was one of the most um, uh, important lawyers of this period. And there is another case that I would like to talk later, which is Julian Lopez del Pino, who actually, based on the reform of the legislation, he was not only, a, I mean, he was not a low, a low income student, but he needed to prove that the family of his wife was low income in order to avoid conflict of interest and therefore keep his position in the judiciary. So probably the last eight decades of the 19th century are going to show a shift in the, in the profession. Now moving forward with the liberal era, we can see a more established and uh, organized legal profession now with the Colegio de Abogados or Bar Association that is founded in 1871. But social mobility is going to once again face a major problem because these organizations require high contributions that many lawyers couldn't afford, especially those coming back from the wars of independence that haven't been able to establish themselves completely. So there were going to be many lawyers that are not going to, to, to join the organization because they couldn't pay the fees. And we're going to see in the list of lawyers those who were not members of the Colegio uh, because of uh, their incapacity to pay the contributions. So. A, a last group that I would like to mention, um, we, I, we, I can go for, uh, deeper on this during the Q&A, is other sectors, other groups that has been marginalized throughout the 19th century for different reasons that is not necessarily uh, wealth, but they found their ways through the legal profession in 19th century Cuba. The first is the case of Afro-Cubans. Um, race was, since, since the, um, the statutes of the uh, required uh, lawyers to have limpieza de sangre. And this is a condition that is going to last until the Colegio of 1852. So people who were not considered legitimate or 
uh, uh, white in this case, especially in a, a slave society as Cuba used to be, um, are going to be somehow marginalized. So there was this myth, for example, about Francisco Filomeno, because he was an, uh, there is no there is no indication at all that he was Afro-Cuban, although he was not a legitimate son. And that was a condition for why we see, we find in sources sometimes reference to him as a mulatto, as an indication of his low social rank with respect to others with a legitimate ancestry. Um, there is a very the, the, almost non incorporation of Afro Cubans to the legal professions up to the census of 1846. When I found one employee uh, in one office in Havana who identified himself as Afro Cuban, and it was a secretary, wasn't any lawyer. So, in during the wars of independence in 1870s, Rodolfo Lagarder, who was from Spain, Barcelona, and uh, he graduated. From the law school in in the peninsula and then he he moved to cuba uh during the wars of independence he held a law degree but he never practiced law in cuba actually he was a political activist and and there's very 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 few references as him as even holding a law degree at all uh after the 10 years war we can see an increasing incorporation of afro cubans to the practice of law Sometimes, as in the case of Juan Roberto Gomez, as a paralegal, so he was not a lawyer himself, but at least he was actively practicing in a way, uh, uh, working with another lawyers in Havana, especially in cases promoting the liberal agenda, such as the abolition of slavery. And the first Afro-Cubans who are actually going to be or receive the title to work in Cuba in, in, in the legal professions is going to be first procurador Manuel Vergas Bruna, who is going to receive his authorization to be a procurador as late as 1893. And at the end of the century, we're going to have two students of law who are going to be Afro-Cubans. The first is Juan Tranquilino Latapier, who eventually is going to become a very famous lawyer in Cuba during the early 20th century. And the other is Bernardo Valdez, whose traces are not very clear. So I'm still working and trying to identify what happened with him after the establishment of the Republic in 1902. So the last case is Francisca Roja Sabate. Francisca Roja was the first female graduated from the law school in Cuba as late as 1893. It took her 10 years to complete her degree, but is perhaps for different reasons, not necessarily uh, obstacles. Actually, she was welcomed and worked with um, very prestigious lawyers and even the dean of the School of Law at this time. Um, but she used to be a school teacher. So she graduated and after she completed her studies of law, she didn't practice and she doesn't chose in any list of the Colegio de Abogados. So all indicates that she came back to the practice of, um, of uh, teaching. She became the director of a school of girls in, in Havana and that's the last reference we have from her, which is an indication also how even when she was able to accomplish and complete the school of law, she didn't decide for practicing in, in a profession that was still pretty much um, controlled by, by men. Um, however, there's a, some indications how social mobility was still taking place within the legal profession in Cuba, even during the very late 19th century. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. And um, again, I want to remind everyone that they can submit their questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And uh, we will begin the conversation with a few questions that I have for Ricardo, and then we'll pick up whatever people are interested in discussing. So I, I noted a few um, items that I think are uh, worthy of more discussion. First of all, in the beginning, Ricardo, you mentioned that there were some contradictions between some of the legal, uh, members of the legal professions and the conquistadores. Can you elaborate on that? What kinds of contradictions were there? Yeah, well, initially there were very few lawyers or any, well, no lawyers, like notaries or procuradores moving to Cuba. So sometimes they, uh, some individuals are pretty known like uh, Panfilo de Narvaez or even Hernan Cortes, they used to, study law at least for a couple of years before going to Cuba or what is used to be the new world. So they are going to relocate to the Caribbean at this time and they start occupying positions. But 
some of some of them are going to become conquistadores and are going to be out of the legal profession themselves eventually, but others are going to remain members of the court. So sometimes conquistadores just wanted to do um, pursue some projects that these bachelors, we were not lawyers, but just people who held a law degree or had some legal education, but they were holding a public position in the island at this moment, they are going to forbade them to pursue whatever project they were, they were trying to do. Uh, one of the most important examples I found is that it's a contradiction between a bachelor who was one of these public officials and the conquistador Vasco de Gama, who is uh, uh, traveling through La Buenos Panama and South uh, Central America. And he's going to send a, a letter to, to the king asking him do not allow bachelors to go to the new world because all they do is interfere with the development of the conquista. So uh, we see this constantly, and that is why uh, there were multiple reasons, not only uh, because initially everybody has heard, I mean, um, Renzo Nores, Matthew Miro, Vitor Uribe, all of them has mentioned this early uh, complaint of the neighbors, but I found that there is more than this. There is, I think this, this largest contradiction. And also there were some of them who became conquistadores themselves, like one member of the court of Santo Domingo de la Audiencia, he's going to renounce to his position or resigns to his position, and he's going to go to explore Florida, which uh, is very interesting. Okay, let me ask you another sort of broader question, which is uh, you discussed the, the growth of a Creole elite that it, you know, eventually grows in, in, in its presence in the legal profession. So I, I wonder if you are making the argument that the growth of this Creole elite that, that then at the end of the 19th century controls, or at least uh, has a, a lot of influence in the legal profession, is that, do you think, a sign of the conflict between peninsulares, meaning people from Spain and, uh, and a local Cuban uh, aristocracy or bourgeoisie, whatever you want to call it? Yes, um, there is certainly a contradiction, although Cuba, that, that is actually one of the reasons I, I understand Cuba was so late in the process of independence, because even when there were this increasing number of lawyers trying to, or people, I would say lawyers, but it's actually the most correct way to say is that people holding law degrees, trying to find a position within um, the public sphere, then they are going to find this mostly controlled by elites or Creoles, um, uh, in, in control of the legal profession, they are going to prevent them to take positions. And for example, if you read the Declaration of Independence of Cuba that Carlos Manuel de Céspedes, who used to be a lawyer, wrote in 1868, he's still complaining about peninsulares controlling the public positions across the island. And if you see, for example, when uh, Carlos Manuel de Céspedes arrived from, from Spain, where he studied, he tried first to settle in Cuba, in Havana. And he couldn't. So he moved back to Manzanillo, which is all the way to the east. And then he became one of the most prominent lawyers in the, in the city because there was basically no competition. But it was basically impossible to have done the same in Havana when all the public sphere and the positions and the court and all the sphere how was controlled by these Creole or Peninsulares elites. Yeah. So my next question is related to this one. It has to do with the political ideology of the legal professions to the extent that you can generalize. Would you say that the, the main trend at the end of the 19th century was to support independence uh, from Spain among the members of the legal profession? And also you, you hinted at the, the abolitionist movement and, and of course those were related. So do you think in general, especially by the end of the 19th century, would you characterize lawyers and their sort of primos hermanos as pro-independence, pro-abolitionist? I cannot say that the whole profession is tending in a way or the other. We, we actually see a very divided positions based on individual interest and positions that can actually change over time based on the circumstances. Um, for example, in 1897, fi Spain finally authorized the autonomic government for Cuba. So some lawyers who has raised in arms against Spain in, 19, in 1895, they are going to abandon the, uh, the Cuban army to be members, like leaders of the autonomist government in Havana. So they are going to constantly change. We actually see a larger, pretty significant uh, uh, incorporation of lawyers to the wars of independence in 1868. 
which I believe is where the largest concentrations were still taking place um, between these local elites or these local lawyers, using the general term, and the peninsulares elites. Um, in the Colegio de Abogados from 1879 um, is going to include a lot of, um, first of all, the Colegio de Abogados in Cuba, uh, in Havana in 1852 is only going to last a few months because it, it is going to be dissolved rapidly because of all the contradictions that it, 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 it included. So when the Colegio of Laos is restated in 1879, we're going to see a way more discipline and a more, uh, more standard visions about um, uh, uh, political positions, but the largest amount of lawyers are going to be either peninsulares, who are just looking at Cuba as a colony, or uh, liberals. But most of these liberals are not aiming for the independence, but for the autonomic regime. So autonomism is going to be the largest movement among these criminal lawyers during the late 19th century Cuba. Okay, great. Now we have a few questions and I'd like to raise them for you. Um, and again, if there are more questions, please do submit it as soon as possible. So Jean Rosenberg, who is always with us uh, for this kind of event, wants you to talk a little bit more about your background illustration. My, oh. Well, the virtual this, background. <laughs> okay, this background is a courtesy of the Cuban Research Institute. They found it for me and I found it very interesting. It's called the courthouse. I don't have more information about it, but I, I felt it was a great fit for this talk because of the amount of people that we see in the chamber. And also because if I don't know if I can move, we can even see somewhere there's a woman that is standing, maybe as a witness, but it's important to have a woman in there, which give my, my presentation more um, uh, um, uh, closer relationship with this image. We don't know whether this is a particular image is from Cuba or somewhere else, right? Oh uh, no, no, I, it doesn't seem re it doesn't really seem Cuban. I wouldn't say that it's Cuban. I would say that it's probably European at the same time. Um, but that would be just uh, I guess I, I haven't seen this image related to Cuba. Great. Now, oh, <clears throat> Gloria Yopera. Uh, Congratulations on your presentation. And then she wants to know if you can elaborate a little bit more on the scholarship for low-income students. So who promoted this initiative and why? Do you have any information about legal professionals who benefited from the scholarship? Yeah, this 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 particular issue is not it is it is happening in Cuba, but it's happening in Cuba as part of Cuba, Cuban being part of the Spanish Empire. And it's happening everywhere across the Spanish Empire, and it has to do more than with actual with the legal profession in Cuba. What the with the political transformations or the liberal transformations of Spain during the 19th century, we uh, liberalism in Spain changed, and different factions took over um, governments after the 1830s. So after liberals, even moderated ones, took over the the profession, um, sorry, uh, the government in Spain, they are start seeking for the secularization of education and the incorporation of both people in an order to way that more people were able going to be educated. So there's this notion that being educated and being liberal, being modern is all related. And low income families were of course, part of the question because uh, Stalin was expensive. Um, so uh, in 1836, Spanish government is going to create the Dirección Nacional de Estudios or the National Education uh, Directory or uh, Center. And this uh, the director, directorio, is going to start implementing a series of reforms, which one of those were this creation of the scholarships that are going to be expanded at some times um, during the 1840s when a, a more uh, progressive faction is going to be controlling the government. But we're going to see this is a bit stable. So when I've really, when I have really seen, uh, and I have the list of multiple lawyers that eventually are going to be part of these local elites during the late 19th century, is after the reform of 1872. After in, in 1872, the University of Havana became basically with, without with no students. So this is a moment when they uh, uh, created these scholarships or expanded the scholarships to attract more students, especially also because. Uh, the local elites has always been sending their, their children to study in Spain. So most of these students who, who attend the University of Havana are Creoles who either prefer to be there or didn't really have the means to study or uh, in Spain. So 
well, since Cuba was at war and they really didn't know what was going to happen, especially when there were many prosecutions in Havana, I mean, Havana is going to lose like 150 lawyers uh, during the first couple of years of the war. So it's a pretty difficult moment to remain in Cuba if you want to be a lawyer. So elites are going to send their children to Spain and this was there, uh, therefore a moment to open up the classrooms and try to bring more people in uh, to study law uh, during these years. Rosa Vogon has a, a comment and a, and a question. Uh, so she uh, notes that in your research, there are, very, are there any examples of relationships between the social mobility and the activity of these people's role you investigated in shaping or promoting the practice of law in grounds apart or more independent from the colonial ones? And uh, what questions are you ahead are you planning from these interesting findings? One question she says uh, would be potentially attractive is to know what happens in the second and third generation of these people and patterns of migration in order to have more legal leeway. Okay, well, I'm gonna to try to answer the question if not, please uh, uh, go back and ask me again. Um, what happened with this is that we see a big jump of this generation during the early 19th century. We, we go from like from 100 lawyers in Havana in 1800 to more than 400 lawyers within four decades. What is happening is that all these massive people that are now finding some uh, economic solvency are going to pay for their children education. But once they become part of the elites or they have a, a position in the public sphere, sometimes they are going to try to make sure that their future generations are going to um, uh, preserve the same position. The problem is that the wars of independence in the middle are going to create like a barrier. So we are going to see that all these numbers are going up, up to the 1850s, but they're going to drop again in the 1860s. So we can divide these generations in two. So after the wars of independence, many lawyers are going to return. So of them are going to be members of the Bar Association, but those would be like the third generations. I'm thinking, for example, in the case of uh, Domingo Mendez Capote, who was very famous not only by himself, but also because his daughter was a famous writer in the early 20th century Cuba. And she, I, I'm sorry, and he, uh, he's going to be like a third generation of one of these families that after being in Cuba for 60, 70 years, he's going to become one of the main members of the elites during the second part, which is after the 10 years uh, war. And we need, what is complicated with this is that I analyzed that some of them struggle to join the these elites, but this is not necessarily a history of elites. This is a history of people that is trying to become elites or uh, finding their positions in society based on a, a, a law degree, uh, which sometimes we assume that having a law degree is necessarily a passport to success, but actually I found that it was all the way around in the 19th century Cuba, it was actually difficult and and once you secure or you procure one of those positions, you are not going to keep it for yourself, but also for your children. So that's why we see that many of these positions are going to continuously be inherited as it used to be during the colonial times. Great. Uh, we have another question from Gene Rosenberg and uh, he asks, was there much mobility in the legal professions among different parts of the Spanish empire? Did this change over time? Yes. Um, well, One of the studies of there's a lot of mobility associated with this because there were a few lawyers, uh, there were a few people with a law degree, especially in, on, on the island. So at first, there was no even um, at the University of Havana was established in 1728. So before this moment, um, these Creoles who wanted their uh, children to have a law degree, they were, were going to send them to Spain or after 15, 15, after 1538 to Santo Domingo or after 1551 to Mexico. But we have a small number of students relocating across the empire. And what used to happen is sometimes when they were going to Spain, I haven't found many Cubans remaining in Spain upon graduation. They usually return. But this is not the case with Santo Domingo or Mexico, especially with Mexico. When they were going to Mexico, sometimes they graduated and then they, through family networks or luck, they got a position in audiencias. I have, for example, the family Recabarren. The Recabarrens are from the 17th century. They are going to graduate in, they are going, they are from Havana. I say the Recabarrens because there were two 
a son, I mean, uh, the, the uncle and, and, and nephew, they are going to study in Mexico. They are going to then relocate. In one case, he's going to go all the way to Manila. And then he's going to come back to Mexico where he's going to remain the rest of his life. And the other one is going to find a position in the Audiencia of Panama and eventually in the Audiencia of Chile, where the Recabarrens actually is a pretty famous name in Chile right, right now. Uh, so yes, we see a lot of location taking place and uh, there is not this um, uh, necessity of coming back to Cuba. Although I've seen also some uh, of these lawyers, especially those who were low income, those who didn't belong to prestigious families, they felt the necessity to go back to the island to support their families with their work now that they're going to be able to have a position in the public administration. Okay. Um... Maite Morales, our colleague from FIU, uh, congratulates you on a great presentation. And I would like to hear how this trip to the FIU archives helped your research and uh, what, what collections did you use and what items did you find most interesting? Well, thank you, Maite, for the question. The first, um, well, um, it has been very successful and it, it was a great help. And that was one of the cases that I mentioned that was going to go further in, this, in the Q&A because I work mostly with the School of Law where I found a significant number of books from the 19th century, which I was very interested in to look at because not all of them are available online. And many of this, these lawyers uh, I'm talking about studied for those books, especially those in the late 19th century. And this collection was very helpful in developing or understanding the intellectual history in the late 19th century. And um, for the special collections of the Green Library, um, they, I found perfectly preserved uh, documentations about um, Julian Pelaez del Pozo, who was one of these lawyers uh, in Cuba. I haven't found a lot of information before coming in here, of course, because all the information was here. So, uh, but now I learned that he, uh, he was a, a Peninsula lawyer who, as many lawyers in, in the Iberian Peninsula, try to occupy a position in the Cuban administration or judiciary in order to boost their career. It was pretty common to have a law degree, then go into the colonies, have a position for a while, and then going back to the, to, the, to, the, to the Iberian Peninsula with a better position at that moment. So he's going to try, apparently he was trying to do this, but for some reason he's remaining in Cuba. And um, he provided a, perf a great example for me about social mobility because all the time I've been talking and looking at this, like people who wanted to do better, people who wanted to be wealthy, people especially who wanted to be perceived as wealthy through religious donations, through uh, uh, caridad. And in his case, there was a reform of the law in 1870 that pre forbade lawyers, in this case, well, uh, members of the judiciary to have a relationship of in this case his wife uh, from the place that uh, the audiencia where he was working had jurisdiction. He happened to be married to one of these, uh, uh, to a Cuban who was living within the uh, jurisdiction. So he need to submit a lot of documentation trying to declare his marriage as accidental. Something that he was saying, my, my marriage was an accident because and he wanted to prove that he didn't have a conflict of interest. And in opposition to almost everything I've seen, he perfectly documented and repeated constantly that his wife was poor, that his, his mother-in-law was poor, that his father-in-law was poor, that they have no lineage, that they were very, they didn't have any power. And it was very interesting because I said, well, now in, in the midst of all these lawyers trying to do better and looking well, I have this one actually trying to prove otherwise in order to preserve his public position because everybody depends on it uh, in the family. So yes, this, the, the, the stay here has been very, very helpful. Excellent. Nicholas Dorr um, notes, um, well, he wants to uh, ask you about the uh, War of Independence. I, I imagine it's 1895. And, and specifically, did Freemasons play an important role in liberal politics and the legal judicial system in Cuba? Are there any similarities between the Cuban constitution and the Spanish constitution of 1931? I know it's a little later than your period of study for today, but I'm sure you have uh, ideas about that. 
Yeah, we need to divide. Well, Cuba had two wars of independence, 1868 and 1895. We can talk first about first about 1890, 1868 rapidly. Um, the War of 1868 was mostly organized through lawyers from the East who wanted to take over the control of the region and therefore uh, transform Cuba into republic. So they are going to, I found this, and there's one of the sources of, um, that explain how they met large gatherings, 60, 70 people, of course, not only lawyers, but other, um, and they created a plan on how to mobilize the rest of the island because they were only in the region of Manzanillo, Bayamo, which is a part of the eastern Cuba. And, and they sent, they tried to do this through professional networks. The problem is that lawyers were not completely aligned on this idea of independence still. And since professional networks did not provide this support, um, they found this through the logias. So the Freemasons are going to be the alternative way for through these lawyers are going to mobilize and not in the in, in this case no longer as legal professionals but now as members of these freemasons organizations um and the same is going to happen in the second part in, in 1895 we still see a lot of activity of the freemasonry uh through uh, with their connection with the legal elites or the local uh elites in this case at the same time, yes, all of these lawyers just came back from Spain. Sometimes, like Carlos Manuel de Césped was the leader of the independence, and he just came back from Spain where he studied law and constitutional law. So we're going to see in the legislation a lot of reflection, not only of whatever the constitutions of Spain said at the same time, but either even some improvement. So some legislations of this Cuban army are going to show more progressive, like the law of divorce that are going to enact in this Cuban Republic that is but actually very pretty fluid because it, it only existed wherever they had control of the land. But yes, wherever this land existed, they tried to implement their legislation. Actually, they were very prolific legislation. We found that uh, the Cuban constitution, of the first Cuban constitution was Guaymaro in 1869. And shortly after they created a Republic with a Congress and this assembly is going to enact a significant number of laws. However, the largest similarity between the Spanish legislation and the Cuban legislation, I found it in 1895, because there are two constitutions. There is the Constitution of Himawayu in 1895 and the Constitution of Layaya in 1897. And especially in the part of the rights. So if you read the freedoms of each of those, and I document this in my book, well, book to be, is, um, you see, I, I do the contrast, so you can see how the, uh, there is a lot of similarity. And I, I believe this is, among many other things, a reflection of the education that they have received, because these are the laws they know. So they are going to either replicate them or improve them or reject them based on their positions. Okay, I think we have a final question. Yeah, from Jorge Saldivar. He wants to know what, what about Weimar? In, in sense of uh, the adoption of the Spanish legislation? Well, sure Weimar, is going, sort of, yeah. okay. uh, Weimar is going to reflect some ideas, but I. this is the first constitution. So there were many, there are major issues that they want to break with like constitutional monarchy. So Weimar is not going to be that similar. You can see, you can identify some similarities perhaps in some rights or um, in the structure of the constitution, but uh, it, the state that they are creating is completely different. And the ideology of these lawyers is, in this moment, I, 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 I would say that the Weimar Republic is pretty, it's a pretty creative moment because you see that these uh, lawyers has actually a, a clear intention to break with the Spanish influence. Um, although I would say that there are other clear moments when they necessarily relied on the Spanish legislation as well. Um, for example, they created a, a martial court and I haven't found a lot of documents from this martial court, but as far as it seems, the the criminal law that they were applying was pretty much Spanish legislation or at least doctrine, which is different because sometimes, you know, in, in, in civil law countries, doctrine is pretty strong. And sometimes when you don't necessarily 
legislate based on those ideas, but you also can apply them through doctrine. And there is a clear doctrine influence from the Spanish uh, education. Um, there is also a relationship between Spain in this case, because we see, especially in the wars of independence, Spain trying to reform um, the legal, the studies at the University of Havana, the legal program. And you can, you can actually see these transformations within the faculty of the School of Law. Uh, when they are trying to, uh, depending on their political positions, trying to um, defend or not more Spanish uh, legal uh, uh, tradition, which is going to be worse towards the end of the century because with an increasing American influence and more tensions between the Spanish and, and the Creoles, then um, the University of Havana and the School of Law and whatever you are going to be able to learn there is also going to become part of the battlefield um, increasingly during the 19th century. Thank you, Ricardo. I think uh, we've run out of time, but thank you for your very interesting presentation and uh, uh, good luck with your book project. Thank you everyone for attending and we hope that we will see you at least virtually in our next uh, public events and uh, hopefully pretty soon face-to-face -face events. So again, thank you, bye-bye. Well, thank you.